All right, here we go. We're going to talk about turbine engine fuel controls, and uh, we'll we'll dive through a few different iterations of this. And and kind of what I've mentioned or alluded to before is it's easier to understand, especially the hydromechanical fuel controls for turbine engines. Uh, if you look at them as kind of a continued evolution of what we've seen with reciprocating engines. So through this whole class, we've started with float carburetors at one of the most basic, and we'll call it primitive versions of fuel metering, and then we've increased the complexity as we've gone through the range into pressure carburetors and fuel injection systems. Now, when I say this is an evolution, I kind of like to look at it as an evolution of the uh, continental form of fuel injection because a continental system is really exclusively looking at fuel pressure, and ultimately when we look at a hydromechanical turbine fuel control, it's doing the same thing. We're looking at the fuel pressures because we don't meter the air when we operate a turbine engine. We, we get as much air that will flow through the engine as flows through the engine. The only thing that we can really change is engine RPM based upon how much fuel we're scheduling into the burner, and that changes our engine speed. There's a couple things that are difficult about this, though. We have, you know, a few things that we see with reciprocating engines, either running too lean, too rich. We can have issues with backfiring, after firing. We can have similar things happen with a turbine engine. So as, a, as an instance, uh, we could have a situation where the amount of fuel is scheduled too quickly into the turbine engine and uh, the engine is not able to keep up with the amount of fuel that goes in and we end up with a rich blowout. So we can actually kill the engine by dumping in too much fuel at once <clears throat> and then the engine will blow out. The other option we may have is if the engine RPM increases too quickly for the amount of fuel that's being scheduled in. So we can't supply enough fuel to keep up and the mixture goes excessively lean, we end up with what we call a lean flame out. So the engine would die because it's too lean. Another issue we can run into that's unique to turbine engines in this case is what we call a compressor stall. And a compressor stall takes two things that start to happen. So as we start to build up pressure inside the burner section, right? So if we take a look, at a very, very, very basic uh, turbine engine drawing here. I apologize. We have our slight Venturi shape as we go through our compressor. Normally, we're going to have air flow through and it's going to get more and more and more compressed as we reach the back of the compressor section. And then we hit our burner section and it gets very, very hot, which increases the pressure considerably and go through this divergent port portion of the engine. And what can happen is if we build up too much pressure in the burner, then we start to increase the back pressure on this compressor section. And what it actually does is it slows down the airflow moving through the compressor section. The issue with that is, remember, all of the veins inside the uh, compressor section, the stator veins, they act like airfoils. And something that will change with an airfoil, right? If we have a certain angle of attack on an airfoil, that's fine so long as we don't reduce the speed. If we maintain the same pitch, but then reduce the speed, then the wing ends up stalling. And the same thing can happen to these stator blades inside the engine. And so as we start to increase the amount of pressure here, we reduce the velocity of air airflow through the compressor. We actually get to a point where the airflow is so slow that the stator veins begin to stall and we lose our airflow through the compressor section in which case all of this burner pressure goes bleh, back out through the front. We get a big bang out through the front of the engine, which can be pretty damaging. So a couple different issues that we face with turbine engines that we wouldn't see from reciprocating engines, but we're supposed to be talking about fuel metering systems, so I'll get back to fuel metering systems. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a few different iterations. Uh, now, these do not represent a complete fuel control, but what we're going to do is look at it from a basic level and then add a little more complexity each time until we get something that more closely resembles an actual hydromechanical turbine engine fuel control. So let's dive in on this. First picture here, we have our fuel tank. We have a boost pump, which is supplying pressure to the engine driven pump. In between, we have a main fuel valve or a shutoff valve for that tank. And we have our engine driven pump, which goes to our throttle valve. Now, one thing you'll notice is this throttle valve is not metering air like it would on a reciprocating engine. It's metering the fuel. And so we basically have a sliding valve that is going to allow fuel to come in from the engine driven pump. And we are going to expose an amount of the orifice that allows it to flow out to the engine and the nozzles. And then in between the nozzles and our fuel control or our throttle valve, we have our fuel shutoff valve 
to shut off fuel positively to the engine, which again is a requirement of a fuel system according to the FAA with type designs of these kinds of aircraft. Next, let's add a little bit more complexity to this. So as we go over to our second drawing, you'll see we have most of the same components here. However, we have this gear type engine driven pump, which is a, a constant displacement pump. So as a result, we need to have a pressure relief valve that allows us to regulate the pressure coming off of this pump. Pretty straightforward. The other thing that we've added in is this minimum flow adjustment. And this minimum flow adjustment, you can think of kind of like an idle air mixture knob on a carburetor. Basically what this is doing, and this is setting the minimum amount of fuel that can flow through when we're at idle. So if this throttle valve is completely retracted and we've blocked off our main output mostly going out to the engine, then we're going to have fuel that bypasses through this minimum flow adjustment and that effectively sets our idle uh, uh, fuel scheduling for the engine. So relatively straightforward, that's all we've added in so far. Let's make this a little more complex now. So in addition to our pressure relief valve and our minimum flow adjustment over here, we've also added this differential relief valve. And the way that this works is actually pretty clever. So we can find ourselves in a situation with the amount of fuel that we're moving, we can actually build up pressures very, very quickly, especially if we make a sudden change in our throttle valve adjustment. And one issue that is there is if we start from a very wide open or a high power setting and we close this significantly, we can have a sudden increase of pressure on the pump side of this throttle valve and it can turn this effectively into a Venturi. We're gonna increase the velocity through and we could actually struggle to maintain the constant speed of the engine. The engine could start to surge or hunt a little bit as the fuel flow varies and that's not particularly helpful for us. So what we've added in is this differential relief valve or this delta P valve. And what this does is it's calibrated to a certain spring pressure and we have fuel pressure on the other side pushing on the back side of this plunger and we have pump pressure pushing on the head side of the plunger. So if we have enough pressure built up on the pump side to both overcome the scheduled or the metered fuel side and the spring pressure, it's going to push this plunger in and it's going to allow fuel to bypass through and come back up to the inlet of the pump. Otherwise, it just stays closed and we have the relief valve which is controlling pressure on that side from the pump. Relatively straightforward, but there we go. Now let's take a look at the thing that's gonna most closely resemble our hydromechanical fuel valve or fuel control, which is over here and you'll see we've added a couple more elements. So we have all the things we talked about before. We have our pump, we have our minimum flow adjustment, we have our relief valve and we have our delta P valve. The thing that we've added in, in this case is a burner pressure aneroid. And what this does is it reads ambient pressure and burner pressure. So we're looking at differential pressure between the two. And like I mentioned before, one of the things that can lead to a compressor stall is excessively high burner pressure. And that's exactly what this valve is designed to do. So if we end up in a situation where our burner pressure is going to uh, uh, cause an issue, then what it will do from the metered side of fuel is it will allow this aneroid to contract and it will open up an additional pathway to return to the inlet of the fuel pump over here. So it allows fuel to bypass away from the circuit going out to the nozzle. So it kind of acts as a little bit of a fail safe to prevent that much fuel from being scheduled into the nozzles if we build up too much burner pressure and it can help to avoid a compressor stall. Relatively straightforward and it works similar to what we see in the TCM system with the uh, aneroid that's attached to the upper deck pressure and the turbocharged engine. So it, it works pretty well. The other thing that we've added in this case is we're actually starting to incorporate something that's kind of like a, a propeller governor in a way. This should be somewhat familiar. We have a spring and we have counterweights on a rotating valve that is exerting pressure on our throttle valve right here. And what this does is it helps us to regulate things like overspeed. It also helps to regulate the speed of the engine overall. So again, something that can happen is as we schedule fuel, we end up making the engine turn faster. It's gonna consume more air. In turn, the demands for fuel may change. And as a result, we can end up in a situation where the engine is starting to hunt a little bit, or we see uh, transitional changes in RPM of the engine, which are not commanded by the pilot. 
which is not ideal. So what we have is a simple flyweight system on our throttle valve, which works very, very similar to how a uh, flyweight system works on a propeller governor to keep the engine on speed. So when the pilot moves the power lever back and forward, what's actually happening is they are changing the amount of pressure that's exerted on this spring, which changes the amount of pressure exerted on these flyweights. As we increase pressure on the spring, it's going to drive this throttle valve down. However, as the speed increases and we reach the set speed and we end up in a situation where we would maybe overspeed, these counterweights are going to fly out a little bit due to centrifugal force, and they're going to exert more upward pressure on the spring. The increased upward pressure, pressure on the spring in uh, uh, defiance, <laughs> acting in opposition to the throttle input on the spring is going to force this throttle valve to move up a little bit and close off some of the fuel until these flyweights come back in and equalize. So it can help control and regulate the speed of the engine as it's operating. And this is pretty close to what we'd see with a standard hydromechanical uh, fuel control. You may see some other elements included where you have a uh, complex or a dual fuel pump included where you have not just a gear driven pump but also a centrifugal impeller at the entrance to supply constant pressure to the uh, gear driven pump. We'd also have things like bypass valves in case the engine driven pump fails. So there's a few different things that we may see, but this is what the system looks like. Now, when you look at your textbook, there's a few different iterations, and realistically, we don't see hydromechanical fuel controls by themselves much anymore, if at all, because this is kind of old technology. We're talking like, you know, from the late 40s into you know, maybe kind of like the mid 70s, because what we did have eventually is the advent of the EEC, or the Electronic Engine Control. And what the electronic engine control did, the first version is we'd end up with a, a hybrid hydromechanical uh, fuel control. So we took the same old hydromechanical fuel control, but then we added a bunch of servos and actuators that were attached to an electronic engine control. And the beauty of that electronic engine control is not only could it operate the inputs, say adding throttle pressure onto the throttle valve, it could also monitor a lot more than a hydromechanical fuel valve would or a hydromechanical fuel control would be able to. Uh, the difference I would say is if you look at say the the Bendix fuel injection system or the Continental fuel injection system, you see a lot of things that are being monitored mechanically. So we have either fuel pressures or air pressures acting on diaphragms and that's what gives us the data for the fuel uh, metering device to schedule fuel. However, if you look at like a modern car fuel injection system, we have a lot more information that's being taken in. We have manifold air pressure, we have mass airflow, we have air temperature, we have uh, uh, all kinds of things. We have uh, O2 sensors, we have a lot of different data points here coming into an electronic computer that are uh, then mapping these fuel schedules based upon the data that it's receiving. And the EEC is very similar. In the earliest iterations, we had those fuel maps and it could read a lot more data and it was making the inputs to an electronic fuel or uh, to a hydromechanical fuel control and that's the way it worked and it, it did pretty good and there are still some of those out there um, one additional piece of complexity that we'll see is outside of a turbine engine uh, when we look at something like a turboprop we not only have the rpm of the engine that, that we have to regulate we also have to regulate the amount of exhaust gas that's flowing through the uh, the turbine that is actually driving our propeller. And so we're going to see more complexity in a fuel control for that. We aren't going to dive all the way in because this is a little more of a high level option, but you will see differences between say an axial flow engine and a turboprop engine for those reasons. Let's take a look at this. So we're talking about data sets and this is an example of some of the data sets that we see coming into an electronic engine control and the different things that it can control. So in this case, like I said, we have a few different things, thrust lever resolvers, uh, digital air data computer, thrust control computer, so on and so on. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but it can control servos that actuate all of these different systems. And it actually gives us some pretty cool things. So for instance, we have our turbine clearance control right here, which is a neat system because what it does is it regulates the temperature of the turbine wheels so we can regulate the thermal expansion and we can maintain clearance between the turbine wheel and the case of the engine which works out pretty well. It also gives us some information 
for how we're going to operate things like heat exchangers, bypass valves, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the reason that I talk about this in a little bit is because this EEC is still a critical component of what we see in more modern engines now, which is the FADEC, the Full Authority Digital Engine Control. So in that case, the EEC is a component of that FADEC system. And in terms of moving parts and all that, it's going to vary a lot aircraft to aircraft, but in terms of the knowledge that you'll have going into this and, and trying to pass your test and your uh, oral and practical is understanding this evolution of hydromechanical to the full uh, FADEC system. And when we do see something with a FADEC, there's just a couple things that we see that are a little more pertinent to say uh, aircraft avionics. So uh, an example of that being with a FADEC system, uh, we're going to have multiple data paths and multiple output paths. And what's actually kind of cool about this is the FADEC will switch between data paths and compare information to determine the best set of information that it's receiving from the sensor side so that it can make decisions to send out to the actuators. And on the flip side, if we have an issue where redundancy is required, say we lose a data path, then it can default to the other. But the crucial thing is if for some reason we have a, a catastrophic event where we completely lose uh, authority from the FADEC, we, we don't have any information anymore, then what's gonna happen is our servos are gonna roll back to basically safe idle positions. So ultimately, if we lose everything, the engine should roll back to idle, which, well, it doesn't give you a lot of power. It does prevent something like an overspeed or something that could cause an engine to blow apart, which would be a bit more catastrophic in an emergency. That's the basic look of what, what you see with uh, turbine engine controls. We'll talk a little bit more about some of these specific concepts in the lab, but we'll see you on the next video uh, to talk about some specific components within the fuel system.